Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to my uh, presentation on a project which is still in progress, started over a year ago, and will culminate with what you're seeing today as being part of that, uh, being able to be viewed online as a podcast, and also a recording uh, in the form of a DVD with commentary will also be produced as part of the final outcome. As you can see from the title of the paper, This is about a piece which is hardly ever played, and there's, as you'll see, there's good reasons for that. It's also suffered you know, over the time by being associated with a major work by Beethoven, his last piano work. So whenever anyone mentions the Dear Bella Variations, you automatically think of the Beethoven work. But this was actually only a byproduct of Dear Belly's original idea. Um, Diabelli wanted 50 composers, then working in Vienna, around 1820, to produce one variation each in a composite publication that he could then claim as his contribution to the state of music in the Austrian Empire at that time, and also would show that he is a publisher and a musician on the way up. He was still quite early in his career at that point. So I think by being associated with greatness, the greatest um, musical minds of his day, he saw that there would be advantage to himself as well. One of the reasons why this piece is um, difficult to comprehend and work with is that once he'd got all his 50 composers together, uh, he just published them in alphabetical order. And you would wonder how can a piece of music that is just by circumstance of how someone's name is spelt defining where you fit in that composition. Does this make a performable piece of music? And I've always wondered that myself. Will it work in live performance? Because that's just a quirk of its creation. But having performed this work over a year ago, I found ways to make it work, and in fact I think it does work in the order he published, even though it's rather a curious way to organise a large composite com uh, composition. Dear Billy himself is known today largely as a composer of small teaching pieces for piano. He's also known as the publisher who got Schubert started, but there's some controversy about that because apparently he didn't always pay Schubert well. Uh, also by association with Beethoven, Beethoven's final piano piece, uh, the name Diabelli will live on. But it's these interesting combinations of piano teacher and performer, composer, because he did compose himself quite a lot of music, and also publisher that are interlinked. And he's one of those rare uh, personalities who could combine all these many facets of his career and through it all uh, become a very successful figure in his time. Of course today he's not as well known as he would have been in his own lifetime. He's also suffered rather negative uh, legacy by Beethoven's description of his theme the theme that inspired this big project as a mere cobbler's patch, ein Schusterfleck, meaning this is just an off cut, this is not a piece of music to be taken seriously. And despite that, Beethoven then went on to write his longest piano composition and one of the greatest sets of variations ever. So even uh, being an insignificant first theme or starting point, it did produce a, a major work. The publication uh, appeared with a rather grand title page, as you can see, and the translation of the title is basically Patriotic Artists Association. Now, you've got to remember at this time, Vienna was just after the um, Napoleonic era. They had seen in their own city the Congress of Vienna, where all the leading powers of Europe came to Vienna to sort out what they would do with the map of Europe after Napoleon was finally put away in exile. And so Vienna had seen itself as a leader in the world and of course for the last 50 years had been a great centre of music making with all the great classical composers, many of them living there. But uh, Vienna was soon going to have to rival places like Paris and London uh, for prominence and in fact many people agree that the high point of Vienna was now passing. Dibeli called on as many people as he could find to produce one single variation, and they're listed there in the title page, or in the next leaf, 
And I've, on your handout, I've given you the list of names and their dates. Don't worry about reading them because I've highlighted some of the more interesting aspects on some of the later slides. They weren't just born in Vienna or living in Vienna. They came from all around the Austrian Empire and even further afield. But it's clear that even by the ones who agreed to this, uh, participate in this project, that Diabelli had scored an amazing achievement by collecting together in one volume a large proportion of the greatest musicians of the day. Not all were pianists, many were conductors or string players or, or, or um, theorists, but they all contributed and so this work has that distinction of uh, pulling it all together. There aren't many recordings of this piece. Uh, the reason being it's a very long and difficult piece to learn. And also the curiosity of it by being organised in the way it is means that some people don't even think of it as a viable performance option. But uh, I have found three recordings and there are examples of people putting together uh, even composite performances. I know of one performance where in the first half someone played only 33 of Diabelli's variations which roughly paralleled the style of writing as Beethoven's 33 variations. So on the first half of the concert was 33 in different order of course that would roughly parallel Beethoven's Opus 120 and on the second half the pianist performed that. So that's an interesting way to look at it. I have uh, the copies of the recording of uh, Doris Adam. Uh, she actually fills out the 78 minutes on the CD and even then she doesn't play all the repeats. So you get an idea, it's at least 90 minutes if you play all the repeats. And of course in this period uh, the question is should you vary on the repeats, should you put extra embellishments. I can't see how you could add any extra notes to the score really, but the style of the day requires that you at least think about that and add embellishments if possible. So uh, it's a huge piece and uh, just like the Goldberg variations, it's a massive undertaking uh, and only the brave should attempt it. I think I was both brave and a bit silly when I said I'd do it. Having, I put it on the program and then had to learn it only a few months before the performance. This is the way it's now published. Uh, it was published in the early 1980s in a collected edition of great examples of Austrian music, so-called monuments or Denkmale. Uh, they're an equivalent series for various other countries uh, to represent their traditions and to publish some lesser known works. It's also available online now, and this is a wonderful resource, the International uh, Music School Library Project. So many um, out of print works, public domain works, are now available there. And so there's no excuse you can actually get online. Unfortunately, the scanning of this version is a little bit unclear. I'd rather play from the published copy, but at least it's available there for anyone who wants to study. Now, just in case you've never heard the theme of the Deep Variations, here it is. So it's a very simple theme in two halves, equal length. Uh, it has certain harmonic sequences that invited some of Beethoven's greatest um, invention on what you do with a sequential pattern leading to a cadence. Um, but it also inspired, as you'll see, some composers working with it in a uh, not deliberate way, but rather create writing around the theme. So we even have some examples of fugue and canon using this theme as the basis. In preparing the work, uh, I found also very little in the way of scholarship on this piece. It's curious that a piece that is always mentioned in connection with Beethoven, whenever you talk about Beethoven's late period, Beethoven's piano compositions, his last piano work, this project is always mentioned in one line and then we move on to Beethoven. So for a much cited and much discussed work, there's very little scholarship. I found a few articles, mostly in German, from the early years of the 20th century up until about the 1970s, 80s. There's also a thesis that was done by someone at Cornell University uh, within the last 10 years, and that's uh, focusing mainly on performance issues, but through that looking at a lot of the background areas as well. 
uh, the person who wrote the program notes or the liner notes for the, that uh, CD I mentioned by Doris Adam is actually an Australian, John Phillips in Adelaide. So uh, there is scholarship, but there's not very much. And even the great um, German music dictionary that we use, if it's not in the New Grove, it'll be in the uh, German equivalent. And even in that huge, vo uh, huge um, reference work, there were many of the composers are not mentioned. At least 10, 15 are not even listed there. So it just shows you it's difficult getting your head around composers which there's no evidence about what their career was about to even then get into their performance style. In this period, of course, there is a, a general consensus of musical style, but it is changing. There's no longer the uniformity of sonata form and concerto form and so on. The romantic style is very much in evidence and people are trying new things in the 1820s. So it's a, it's a time of change and so there's not likely to be a consistent way of even performing these pieces. And that was an interesting challenge, playing one piece but playing 50 one composers if you conclude, include the, the theme itself. We don't normally have to grapple with that idea of playing multiple composers in one piece. We do it on mixed programs but not normally within a single work. So the questions that arose for me from doing uh, this project was firstly that very issue of collaborative composition. In Western music we often think of the solo composer and then they might write for ensembles and of course that's often done. But we don't hear very much about composers who work together or get published within a single piece and I'll refer to some <coughs> examples of that shortly. Uh, also playing a piece for which there is no real performance history. Three or four recordings maximum, hardly any live tradition of performing this in concert. Like, unlike when you play a work by Beethoven, there's something in you, your oral memory speaks to you as you work on your own interpretation. You can't avoid the fact that you've heard the Moonlight Sonata many, many times. It has to affect your own interpretation somehow. But with the piece for which there's no performance tradition, you're starting with a blank page. And I found that particularly exciting. It's like playing a new work for the first time, where you are creating the first performance. It was that sense of adventure. And then, as I've already referred to, a piece that's just organised A to Z by name of composer that creates a challenge in itself. How do you organise a piece like that? As I said, the notion of a single work being composed by multiple people is rather unusual, but it's not uh, at all unheard of. In looking into this genre, uh, I found there were quite a few pieces from the early 19th century in the collective uh, uh, genre. Uh, the first I know of, and there may be uh, precursors to this as well, is the uh, collection of songs in Questa Tombo Scura. We often hear the Beethoven contribution to that, a single song that he wrote. Uh, and if I count correctly, there are 49 composers in that collection. Now, that collection was uh, produced in the early 1800s up to about 1810. And it's possible that uh, Diabelli knew that collection and, of course, the impetus after the Congress of Vienna, regaining Austrian um, identity after the Napoleonic invasions and so on, uh, perhaps he felt, well, this is one way we can all work together and produce a piece. So he had at least that once um, precursor. And no doubt everybody was aware that Diabelli was working on this because I think there were others who tried to beat him to print. The collection that came out in 1823 as just a collection of dances. Uh, but then curiously in 1824, a collection of 40 waltzes by multiple composers. I think people were getting a bit uh, anxious or a bit um, uh, suspicious perhaps that Diabelli was never going to finish his project. They'd already seen Beethoven's work published in 1823 and they knew, if not themselves, they knew other people who had been asked to write variation. So perhaps there was a move, well, if he's not going to do it, we'll publish a large work and beat him to it. So someone got together a collection of 40 waltzes. And then you notice the, the title um, uh, of the next one that came out the year after Diabelli's, Let's Stick Together. It's a sort of an Austrian dialect that's used in the actual title. It's the idea of let's all work together as Austrian composers and produce our own music and publish together to show some sort of solidarity, if you like. 
Then there were a range of other works, and notice after Diabelli's, which is 1823, uh, we have two sets of 50 pieces, plus a coda, which is exactly what Diabelli did. So I'm pretty sure he set the uh, benchmark or the uh, precedent for similar works. Of course, novelty soon wears out and you can't keep on producing things like that, but at least a couple of people tried. Then we have the, probably the most famous collective um, set of variations, the Hexameron Variations, which was put together by six composers who were basically working in um, Paris, including Liszt and Chopin and Pixis. Pixis is one that appears in Diabelli's set. So that came out and that's reasonably often performed. Rural Britannia Variations came out around the same time. And then another piece which I'm actually going to be performing also this year, the FAE violin sonata. This was written just as Schumann was approaching his final illness and Brahms had just arrived on the scene. And the FAE stands for Frei aber einsam, free but lonely. And it was a uh, comment based on um, friends talking to each other through their music and using this as a motto, if you like. So the four movements, Schumann wrote two of the movements, Brahms wrote one and Dietrich wrote another, are all based on the musical letters FAE, which has an acronym for um, a um, set of words, which has a deep meaning. So um, that's an interesting one, but that's a, a chamber work. Most of the others are piano pieces. And I'm also I'm aware of a few others. There's a set of uh, Russian composers who published a set together in the late 1900s, 1800s. And even in the 20th century, there was one publication by the French composers Les Six, the six composers around 1920. And even Benjamin Britten, one of his early works was published with his friend Lennox Berkeley, and they didn't disclose who wrote which piece in this set of orchestral um, uh, works. So the phenomenon is there, but it's just not that common. Now let's look closely at Diabelli's uh, group of uh, composers. You have it on your handout as well, but it's exactly what's up there. Uh, rather a dazzling array of people and uh, where they were from, how old they were at the time, um, what their role in the musical world was. So all of that's very interesting and I found that quite fascinating to see the number of points of intersection, the number of areas where people had similar teachers or worked in the same theatre or worked in the same educational institution. Uh, people who dedicated works to one another or gave first performances of each other's works. So all of those connections were there and uh, that was quite a fascinating way. It's just like if you put together all the people you know right now and find all the connections between them, it would be this amazing jigsaw. That's what life is usually like. Uh, the cross-section of the interplay is, is quite complex. So as I said, there were quite a number of different types of musician represented here. They weren't all pianists but obviously this is a piece of piano music. What I've um, put together on this particular image is uh, while Austria itself was a conglomerate empire which would then get even bigger through the 19th century, there were many within the Austrian Empire who felt that they were Bohemians or Moravians rather than being Austrian necessarily because of the history of the Habsburg Empire. Salzburg also too was for uh, a long time an independent city-state and then got overrun by Napoleon and got folded into um, Austria eventually. So um, the local heritage or the local um, culture of these places is very strong but there was this overriding uh, allegiance to the Austrian Empire. For most of these, although some of the composers came from the German states, formerly the Holy Roman Empire, so they come from all over. So if you can see a lot of Bohemians, a lot of red, they figure quite importantly. It was often called the musical conservatory of, of all of Europe because so many musicians came from Prague. Moravia, uh, also within what was the, well it's now is its own state again, it was part of uh, the Czech Republic, uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, Hungary, uh, List is probably the only one we can claim there, although a few people did work in Budapest. Uh, Salz Salzburg produced a few, and then the various German states, mostly west of the Rhine and um, in the south. So they come from all over, but there was a connection with Vienna, there was a connection with Diabelli, otherwise they wouldn't have been included. This is an interesting um, area of crossovers. 
many of these people were teachers and they wrote either books on music theory or they were known for their teaching practice. Uh, they were sought out by younger musicians for guidance and mentoring. And if you look at, the, say, Tomaszek, for instance, he taught at least two of these people uh, piano, probably. Uh, also Weber, another one of the um, uh, Bohemians. Uh, Furster was a well-known um, uh, teacher. He taught a couple of them. Hummel was a famous uh, teacher in various places, so he um, had one. Cherney and Liszt, that's probably the most famous teacher-student relationship here. Uh, Liszt was actually studying with Cherney only for a short period uh, around the time he wrote this, his own variation. So that's an interesting set of connections, and I, I did produce a number of others of these for a conference paper on this topic a while back, but I just thought that would be just one good illustration of how these different musical lives intersect. Another interesting for me, as I said, this is a piece that lies in the shadow of the musical canon. But many of these composers knew the big three or four of Austrian classicism. They either had studied with Mozart, Beethoven, or Schubert. In Mozart's case, his younger son is represented here. Uh, Beethoven, of course, was connected with uh, many people in different ways. Two of the people up here played in the string quartet that premiered uh, most of his major um, works. Uh, Schubert, the connections there, uh, particularly with Hüttenbrenner, who was given the score of the Unfinished Symphony and uh, was responsible for keeping it safe so it could eventually be performed. So there's various connections there. Um, I couldn't find as strong connections with Haydn. Um, he had only lived in Vienna in his later years, really. Um, and also he's of an earlier generation. So this generation is either, well, Beethoven and Schubert were still alive and Mozart um, was only you know, a decade or two before. So uh, the connections there are quite um, close and interesting. Another thing about this group of composers is that uh, some of them are very young and some of them are very old. The average age I worked out was 41. But look at some of them. The, uh, the oldest composer was born in 1748 and the youngest composer died in 1886. So between that, you've got a span of about, well, nearly 150 years, but in reality, probably 120 years of creativity because you don't start writing the minute you're born, although Mozart may have. Um, but normally you wait 10 or 20 years to start producing mature works. So um, the wide span of musical eras and styles. One of them lived to be 91, and as we know, Schubert died uh, quite young at 31. 22 of them lived to be more than 70. So this myth about people always dying young, you know, the, the most famous artists die young. You know, there were many who lived into their 70s and were active and working into their old age. So age doesn't matter, as this table shows. And also, too, uh, a number of composers had connections which go well beyond this period of the early 1820s. And I found this a fascinating set of connections, too. Uh, Czapek, who um, had spent some time in Poland as well as Vienna, was the person who hosted Chopin's visit to Vienna when he came there, not knowing where he would go. He eventually lived in Paris, but he spent a bit of time in Vienna. I won't go through all of these. Uh, Paganini played some of the works of one of the composers. One of them taught Bruckner, one taught Strauss, one was a friend of Mendelssohn, and so on it goes. And the, well, uh, Schoberlechner was really interesting, learning that he went to Russia and taught the person that we claim is the beginning of the Russian school. So the tentacles of this group of composers goes everywhere and for a, a huge body of music and time well after this composition. Now we can't claim because they wrote a variation for Dear Belly, they then had later success. I'm not saying that at all, but what I am saying is that this volume represents all those connections in some way. It's a link, and it's the one time they all came together. And if we were to do that with other types of musical evidence, we would see this uh, incredible complexity of how musical lives affect other musical lives and so on. Why did he wait for um, to get 50? I've often wondered about this. It's a nice round number. Um, I, have, I have the feeling that he really wanted to get to 50, not only because it is a nice round number, but perhaps no one had done it before. Perhaps he knew that the earlier song collection only got to 49 different composers. 
I don't know. I've even got evidence that he possibly, particularly uh, nagged a few of his composers to help him finish his number 50. Now, reading this, um, this is like a letter for an assignment, assignment extension that many of us are very used to reading. The reason why I haven't written your variation is, well, I've been a bit sick. Oh, I've been a bit busy. Actually, you know, I'm not that keen on variations, really. But since you asked me a second time, and since I like you, I'll help you out, and here's my variation. Huh. So yeah, this was obviously dragging a variation out of this man. Um, it's, so it's quite, it's quite um, humorous when you read it, because he's obviously not wanting to insult dear Belly, and he wants to be supportive, but circumstances didn't let him. But he, he wrote his variation. He's one of the more difficult ones as it worked out. Oh, it's right near the end of the volume. So I think there was a plan there to get to 50. Um, but it seems that some of them uh, didn't spend a lot of effort. They knew Dear Belly, but they weren't going to write their magnum opus like Beethoven was. They were just going to write, here's your variation, thank you very much, see you later. So some of them, I feel, didn't um, put their greatest efforts into this piece. But what, there's only a few that we can even date. We think Dear Belly sent out his... Uh, invitation in 1819. We don't have the original correspondence. But the earliest one was written by Cherney, and we know that Cherney, he was a total workaholic. He worked 16 hours a day, constantly teaching, writing, doing whatever. And so he probably said, well, if I'm going to do this, I'll do it right away. And then, then later on, he was asked to write the code that concludes the work. Um, a few others, we have dates on the manuscript, and the one I refer to there by Vitaschek. Uh, was written in early 1824, just a few months before Diabelli came into print with this work. So, um, roughly a five-year time span, but many we don't know. For Liszt's variation, it says on the score, a youth of 11 years from Hungary. So, in his case, it can only be in his 11th year, but then people often lie about child prodigy's age, so even then we're not sure how old he was. A sad thing about it is, um, Emanuel Furster um, died before this publication came out. So it's, it's rather sad because he obviously put a lot of effort into it. It's one of the, it's the longest variation, in fact. So there you go. So um, I thought I'd play some of the ones just to illustrate uh, the ones who perhaps just did a quick variation without a lot of um, extra effort. And then two that have an interesting connection as well. So here we have the uh, variation by Hall first. I won't play the whole theme, I'll just play the first half uh, because of time. also fairly um, straightforward. Now we have the two by probably the most famous composers represented here, Liszt and Schubert. They're both called France, and they both, well they are, the only ones written in C minor in the whole set. Now, is that coincidence? Probably so. But it's curious. The two Franzes chose to write in C minor. And here we have uh, Liszt. As it says there, boy of 11 years, born in Hungary. Uh, yes, the impetuous Liszt, trying to be taught by um, Cherny. the keyboard, as he would later on, of course. Now, I will indulge by playing all of the Schubert variation because it's just a wonderful setting, and also it really stands out. When I played the complete work about this time last year, everyone loved the Schubert best, whether they're prejudiced by seeing his name on the screen, because I showed, as we went through, I gave the name and the portrait if I had it, and just a few details about each of the composers. 
but it does stand out. It really is a very interesting variation, and you wouldn't think it's from that original, uh, rather straightforward thing. So here's Schubert's uh, C minor variation, and just for your interest, because I'm playing it on a piano authentically from that time, built around 1820. Um, there are two devices with the pedals I can use here, and one is the due corda, the two-string effect, which means when I push down the left of, of the three pedals, the whole keyboard moves over so that only two strings per note are sounded rather than three strings per note. So it has a slightly veiled quality because of that. So here's Schubert's variation. There are some interesting performance considerations because the set of variations aren't all always in a predictable order and some of the variations stand out because they're quite different in texture. So how do you make a set of rather randomly sorted styles into a convincing performance? Now I've put up here the score of what I found one of the two most difficult variations to play. Um, the one by Archduke Rudolf. SRD stands for Serenissimus Rodolphus Dux, His Most Serene Highness, the Archduke of Austria. So, and he of course was associated with Beethoven. The greatest number of dedications to any one person by Beethoven is Archduke Rudolf, 10 or 11 pieces, I think. Beethoven, as we know, chose not to participate in this publication. And so, Archduke Rudolf being his most exalted and probably most famous student, said, well, if Beethoven isn't going to be there, I'll be there on his behalf and I'll write a four-part fugue. So he did. And with your indulgence, I'll play the recording of this because um, it'll save me a little bit of effort and time because um, I wanted to focus on my talk today. So I'll just play a few excerpts of um, uh, the Archduke Rudolf uh, variation. It is a, quite a Beethovenian, Beethovenian uh, style fugue in that starts out more or less in four real parts and then pretty soon he goes into doubling, doubling octaves and sixths. Uh, quite complex textures but you can really trace three or four parts at any one time so it's quite busy. janky in the instrument. Uh, this was the first time this piano was played in public, except for a very small private performance. Uh, I don't know for how long. So the piano itself, even though it's doing very well for nearly 200 years of, of age, uh, getting used to Queensland climate and conditions here, uh, we found out certain things about the instrument as the concert proceeded. No matter what you rehearse, you then find things. So some of the technical issues with the way the strings settle in and, and, and all the various parts of the action. So there was a little bit of jangling on that recording, but that's just one of the joys and challenges of playing a, a period instrument because there will be these things, even in the day, I'm sure they weren't all perfect at all times. So in case you're wondering what the percussion effect was, that was just the way the strings were functioning about 40 minutes into the piece. So we have something like that, which is a rather complex, um, extended sort of conception. You've already heard some excerpts of the very straightforward A and B 
uh, repeated bipartite form. So that's there as well. Um, you have a number of other, other variations which are of a genre. They're in a style of a different dance form perhaps. So you have the whole extreme of possibilities. So how do you put it together and how do you shape such a performance? Um, I was asked several times had I thought of reordering the pieces so they weren't played A to Z but in a more logical form where I could create sections and, and shape the work like that. I did think about that but then I decided no I'll give this a go playing through as published and then find natural resting points as I went along. So that's how it evolved and I'll just show you here this is illustration of how many and there aren't that many, in fact, there's only six that didn't conform to the straight binary form. But the, uh, what I did in the end was find a six to eight minute or five to eight minute section that would be a natural breathing moment, because everyone needs to breathe, the audience as well as the performer. And there were some that were these longer, more extended variations that sort of stand alone either as a culminating point also, the change of key sometimes says you must, well, it was an opportunity to stop or start at that point. Sometimes one of the variations ended with a more complex or more brilliant finish, so that was a good concluding point. So by building to, in about um, 10 sections, I could create the sense of coherence or binding together in some way. And in some cases, one variation led it very logically straight into the next. And I don't know if there was any collusion between composers. I doubt if they knew, even to the last minute, who was actually in the collection. So even if your name sounds like someone else's, there was no guarantee you'd be next door to them in the collection. So I think it was a, a totally random ordering. And then out of that, the performer then has to create the, um, the sense of logic. And I, I, thought, I thought it worked quite OK. And that way, I could. Um, convince myself and the audience this piece can be performed as published. So I've got two examples here of how I made those decisions. This is the variation number 14, which starts in A flat, and quite a different style. It's in a slower tempo, coming after a rather brilliant one. So that was a good logical dividing point. And another one here, also a slow movement style variation in a key other than C major, coming after a very brilliant one. So that were they were examples of how you could create the gaps and the breathing points. Um, because of their interest and also trying to highlight anything that wasn't in a straightforward style and wasn't in C major, that was another way of creating points of interest. Because when you've got 50 variations, all based on the same theme, you want to highlight everything that's more different to the theme rather than everything that's more similar to the theme. So it's a natural way of creating interest and um, uh, I guess a, a, uh, continuity in a sense because we're not being uh, taken back to the theme always. We're always being extended forward and then, oh, then that variation is more like the theme. Oh, this one's quite different and so on. You go through and it's a sort of a journey as you go through because there's nothing worse than a set of variations where you can kind of tell what the next one's going to sound like. That's what kills the variation form. The best variations are a sense where you're actually progressing with the composer and he's showing you something new for every next variation. Okay, um, I'll just play you a little bit of those two because I, I do find them quite interesting, just like I found the Schubert quite interesting. Potsalka is one of the composers that I knew very little about and his setting is almost like a romantic nocturne at times. So he starts the theme you can more or less tell it comes from Dear Belly at the beginning. And so on. So he hides the thing in the middle there. And then after that introductory sort of uh, section there, on the end of the third line, he goes into a nocturne style and uh, branches out. And it's really romantic right in here.
enter into quite another world uh, with that one. Um, the other one which was particularly interesting and also gave me an opportunity to experiment with the instrument uh, a little was the one by um, Kurtzkowski. Another very unknown composer, I've yet to find any real information about him. And for this one I'm going to use the middle pedal, which is an interesting device on pianos. Uh, the Viennese particularly like this device and you're welcome to have a look at it after. Uh, what happens is between the hammers and the strings, by pushing this pedal down, a band of felt comes in between. So I'm still playing all strings, three strings per note, but it's they're all muted with hammer striking felt which strikes the string. So another sound world as well. So um, this is the variation uh, number 20 by Kurskowski. sound to anything else on the program and of course you would only use that as a special effect and that was my moment in that piece for that special effect. The Czechs, as I said, or the Bohemians rather, were quite important. Um, actually Pani uh, is the next one I have here. His was interesting because it was in the minor key. Um, I'll just play a little bit of that because it's, it's also an interesting one. I was delighting in anything that got me away from C major. There's only so much C major anyone needs in a, in a concert. Now we get to the Bohemians. Uh, first uh, was the one who wrote the longest piece and it was a more or less a fugato. And what's interesting about that is he chose to write his fugato section in E-flat, just like Beethoven does in his 33 variations, so that's curious. Now, finally, the, the Czechs. And here we have Tomaszek, who was one of the more prominent uh, of those people working up in Prague. Um, and he writes a, a, a polonaise, so it's quite um, brilliant and uses the top of the keyboard. Polonaises were quite popular, Beethoven wrote Thank you. pieces as well as straight variations as well as contrapuntal works. It's quite a varied um, output when you put them all together. The um, most difficult, I'm now talking about the Bohemians as a group and as you saw they're probably the largest single group uh, within the set. Franz Dionysius Weber was quite a proud man as far as I can read. There's more information available about him and I get the impression that the Bohemians, who often, I feel, resented the fact that they had lost their throne to Austria some centuries before, um, felt they were better than the Viennese after all. And so if a, someone in Vienna is going to ask them to write a variation, they're going to make it more difficult than anyone else would dare. And this is the one that almost did me in because it is just so difficult. Uh, it's difficult not just because of the demands, but also the fact that there's varied demands. It's, it doesn't um, stop right at the end.
So uh, that was one of the hardest pieces I've ever played in my life. But what was interesting about this, the fact I say the Bohemians were a group, a lot of their names started with a W, which is right near the end of the alphabet. And so therefore, um, having them there as a set of rather virtuosic variations right near was actually a nice gift because it meant that there was this sense of culmination and then after these couple, there's a slightly softer one, and then it builds up to the big code at the end. So the ending worked quite well just because of that particular bit of um, rivalry between the people from Prague and those in Vienna. Just to show you a little bit of the coda by Czerny. Dear Belly obviously was in close contact with Czerny. Um, Czerny would, would always help out. He was a very diligent sort of person. And when asked to write a coda, of course, he complied. And so in his variation, or he had written a variation earlier, but in his coda, uh, he actually moved once again away from C major through different keys, different styles. And it's quite a brilliant conclusion, and it works particularly well. Uh, and then at the end, the last page is basically all in C major, and then you get this ending, and you feel you've arrived somewhere. So thanks to that, the piece does end well and um, justifies the journey you've been on. What did I learn from this project, which, as I said, is still on the way? I will now produce a studio conditions type recording uh, by the end of the year. Um, it's fascinating to see all these musical minds coming together in a single piece at a, at a particular time within a five year period based in one place. I've always been interested in the lesser known composers, the people you, who didn't have such good press agents. Uh, the people who are famous in their own lifetime and then immediately fade from view. Uh, I think we spend far too much time on the standard canon, which I think is actually decreasing, not increasing, even though we've got recordings of basically anything you want these days. The public performance repertoire in some areas is not actually expanding. So the less, anything about lesser known works or composers I find uh, interesting and I like to investigate that. Uh, the idea of several composers getting together in a single piece I think is particularly interesting and there are quite a few examples and I'd be interested to find if someone's done it, find a list of those or, or start uh, building on the one I've already started because that's a phenomenon that is uh, quite different to our normal conception about what a composer's role is. Uh, on a teaching level, uh, it would be possible, I've often had the dream of getting together 50 piano students and assigning each one of them one variation. Having played them all now, I don't know that I'd wish number 40 and number 45 on anyone particularly, uh, but, but we have people who are willing for a challenge, so perhaps I'd find the right people. Uh, you could do a collaborative performance of a collaborative composition and share out the work between it. We've done several of these over the years, one night we had a lot of different pianists play one or two of the Chopin Nocturnes and have the whole set played in one night. One year we did the complete Well Tempered Clavier book one, shared around nearly 24 pianists. So we got to hear the whole piece but shared around. So there are these opportunities. We have many sets of music uh, where there are short pieces collected together and why does it only have to ever only always be a single performer? So collaboration could exist on that level too. And the paper that I wrote for a conference last year, which will be linked to this uh, podcast uh, when it's actually available online, it's soon to be published, um, I gave the title of that work, or posed a question, is this work a monument or a monstrosity? And many have argued that it's the latter, but I convinced myself, and I hope I've convinced you, that it's actually quite a big monument of music. So there you have it, Dear Belly's Variations. Thank you.